Ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear guests, in the name of the Studium Generale, I welcome you all to tonight's lecture by Simon Kyaga on creativity and madness. As you might know, uh, this lecture is the second in a series of talks on creativity. Last week we had a talk by Scott Barry Kaufman, uh, who spoke on the. Oh, Sorry. <laughs> Do you hear me now? Yeah. Even in the last row. Okay, good. <laughs> Once again, I welcome Simon Kyaga to this lecture on creativity and madness. My name is uh, Julian Hanich. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Arts, Culture and Media. And as it happens, my colleague Mary Kempering and I were teaching a course in a research master on madness and art this semester. So I'm personally very interested in what Simon has to tell us tonight. So, as you might know, this talk is the second installment in a series on talks on creativity. The first one last week by Scott Barry Kaufman on creativity, flow, and openness to experience. And the next one will take place uh, in two weeks' time on October 8th with a talk on creativity off and in groups by a group of social scientists from Groningen. That talk will be in Dutch. So the idea that there is a nexus between madness and creativity is a very, very old one. And I just want to give you one very famous, often quoted passage from Aristotle that is about 2,300 2, years ago. So Aristotle asked the question, why is it that all men who have become outstanding in philosophy, statesmanship, Poetry or the arts are melancholic or are infected by the diseases arising from, from black bile. So that's 2,300 years ago. And personally, I have a brother who is an artist. I have a sister who is an actress. And I'm wondering whether my utter lack of creativity implies that I have an advantage in terms of mental health <laughs> in comparison to my siblings. That is, I hope, a question that Simon Kyaga will be able to answer for me tonight. <laughs> Let me give you a couple of um, notes to the back, uh, on the background of Simon Kyaga. He's attending physician in psychiatry in uh, Lindinger. Is that how you pronounce it? Lindinger, yes. Here, near Stockholm. And he's also a PhD student at the highly prestigious Karolinska Institute just outside of Stockholm. And just incidentally, that's also the institute that's going to award the Nobel Prize for medicine or physiology in about two weeks from now. So it is that prestigious. So please join me in welcoming Simon Kyaga. So thank you, Professor Hanich. The first question of today is, is there really an association between creativity and mental illness? And if so, why is this association present? Now this would be the, the sort of topic for tonight's lecture. But um, I will start by saying that the very idea of an association between creativity and mental illness has its beginning, as Professor Harnish rightly pointed out, uh, in the antiques. Now, Aristoteles has been quoted as saying that no great genius has ever existed without a strain of madness. In fact, it's more of the like that Professor Harnish said. But this idea really progressed throughout history, and later times saw, for instance, Dryden argue that great wits are sure to madness near light and thin partitions to the bounds divide. But it was really during the Romantic era that this idea took a stronghold of Western culture. 
And a good example is Lord Byron, who allegedly suffered from bipolar disorder. But in fact, there are some suggestions that the sort of idea of this association came as a consequence of a strategic sort of process instigated by the intelligentsia at the Romantic uh, period. Because uh, after Napoleon's defeat, they argue that new revolutionary ideas of a society led by a sort of enlightened class, while it was not very fashionable anymore, and somehow these men of letters had to assert their special status in society. And what they did was to turn back to this old and ancient idea of the genius as possessed by mad demons. Now, this gave them a special sort of place and opportunity in society to speak more freely, in an otherwise quite dangerous way. But following this idea, there was a growing field of psychiatrists and psychologists, and they made more and more studies showing that creativity was not only associated with a sort of divine madness, but maybe even to pure clinical madness. Now, most extreme in this sense was probably the Italian psychiatrist Cesare Lombroso, who worked in the end of the 19th century. And he argued now that genius was not even possible without madness, because genius was simply a constitutional defect that showed itself as madness. Now, Lombroso, also known for his studies on crime, he argued that certain anatomical features could be associated with criminal behavior, and of course, he later fall into disrepute, and the whole idea of an association between genius and madness sort of adopted a more sober view. So following Lombroso, in the beginning of the 20th century, Lange Eichbaum presented his study on about 800 geniuses, and he now said, that the genius was in fact the consequence of a sociological process. He says that the one who is not called a genius is no genius. But nevertheless, Lange Eichmann said, it is really strange that among these great historical geniuses, there is only a minority who have been psychiatrically healthy. And as some of you might know, um, psychiatric diagnosis has also sort of progressed uh, throughout history. And much of today's uh, sort of psychiatric diagnosis rests upon the ideas of Emil Kreplin, who worked some hundred years ago. Now, what he did was to introduce prognosis as an important aspect of diagnosis. And he found that among those patients who were severely psychiatrically affected, there was two groups that sort of divided up. One he called dementia precox, and the other one manic depressive illness. Now, for uh, dementia precox, there was a sort of progressive development that once you got it, it got worse and worse, whereas in manic depressive illness, it was more of an intermittent uh, sort of development. So you were severely disabled for a while, but then you returned to a sort of less affected state. So dementia precox is pretty much what we call a schizophrenia today, and manic depressive illness is... Uh, basically bipolar disorder. And in schizophrenia, we have the presence of psychosis, what today means a sort of aberrant perception of reality, often with hallucinations that we see or hear things that are not present, or delusions, maybe the idea that we are sort of subjected to some kind of uh, uh, scheme or, or something, and also sort of uh, cognitive symptoms. In bipolar disorder instead, we have the variation in mood, ranging from low uh, melancholia to depression and up to the agitated manic episode. But also often present in bipolar disorder is uh, psychosis. Now, some would say that these disorders being associated with creativity is simply not true. So Salaruda Ali, for instance, said that the only difference between me and a madman is that I'm not mad. But related to the question of more severe psychopathology is the idea that sort of crisis could be associated with creative growth. Now, this idea has been advanced by many different authors, but um, one is uh, Jack, who lived in, uh, um, well, in the beginning of, 
uh, or started his career in the beginning of the 20th century, and he sort of promoted the idea of the midlife crisis, focusing on adult development. And when it came to the uh, creator, he argued that there was only three possibilities open at midlife crisis. One was that the creative career would end. The other one would be that the creator would simply die, or hopefully would develop. So if the creator develops, it would be both in method and, and in content. So what it claims is that uh, before this midlife crisis, you have a sort of a young and spontaneous and intensive uh, uh, creativity, where the artistic creativity is sort of fast and only limited by the creator's sort of physical limitations to write words or make music. And he exemplifies with Mozart and Rimbaud. Whereas after the midlife crisis, sort of following a, a positive development, there is a more mature sculptural creativity where the initial inspiration uh, must first be sort of externalized and then chisel out in an interaction uh, between the externalized item and sort of the uh, unconscious inspiration. And he argues that fraud is an example of this. Now, when it comes to the content, it is really sort of the change in working method between this early and mature adulthood that is a change from an unrestrained to a sort of sculpted creativity. And he argues that out comes the emergence of a tragic philosophical content which progresses to the tranquility of creativity in mature adulthood. And the question is, of course, why? So why does this happen? Well, he argues that there are two reasons. One is that we realize that life is limited, and the other one is the existence of hate and destructiveness. So he says that when death and human destructiveness, that is when both death and death instinct is taking into account that the quality and content of the creative expressions change to this tragic, reflective and philosophical stance. And that the successful outcome of mature creative work lies in the constructive resignation both with regards to the deficiencies in humanity and limitations in the artist's own work. And it is really sort of this constructive resignation which then conveys tranquility of life and work. Now the problem with very interesting ideas like this, and I think this is a very interesting idea, is that the empirical support for this kind of argument is quite weak. But there is some suggestion that just being reminded of one's own mortality might enhance creativity under certain conditions. And as far as I know, there are two unpublished studies that have actually looked uh, on this by Forgard. The first one uh, was a, a sort of aimed at web users in the United States, and they were asked to um, uh, respond to experiences of, of uh, traumatic events and then self-reported creative growth. And what was found was that positive and negative changes in interpersonal relationship predicted increased self-reported creative growth. And in a second study, a smaller study, uh, but a more global one focused on a uh, Rwandan sample um, where people had been exposed to the traumatic event of the genocide. Uh, similar uh, findings were made that there was on mean an increase in creative growth following the event of, of this uh, terrible uh, genocide. But what I find interesting is that there was a bimodal distribution, meaning that most people did not report an increase in creative growth, but uh, a small part, around 25%, reported sort of a, a moderate or, or larger increase in creative growth. So one might then ask, what is it among those people who actually report uh, creative growth that makes them more creative following sort of environment stimuli? And I think this really boils down to the question of tonight's lecture, might there be some sort of personality trait, maybe even based on a sort of a genetic foundation, that provides the possibility for creative growth? And the last uh, 30 or 40 years or so, there has been increasing uh, sort of scientific studies into the question if there might be 
uh, a vulnerability for uh, psychiatric disorder that also makes it possible to increase creativity. And one of the first studies was by Carlson at the Institute of Genetical Studies in Iceland. And in 1970, he looked at some 500 relatives of patients with psychosis, so both schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. And he could show that these relatives more often were represented in this book called Who's Who, those with great achievements. And also, when he narrowed down to those with only creative achievements, he could also see that there was an increase of relatives of patients there, although not significant because the material was pretty small. But following Carlson's study, there was another study by Rothenberg in 1983 on 143 individuals, 18 of them Nobel laureates, and 12 were inpatient-treated psychiatric patients from a private facility with different diagnoses, and the rest were students. And he used um, uh, sort of a, an estimation of a cognitive flexibility, you could say. And what he found was that the Nobel laureates, they responded fastest, whereas patients responded much slower. And the, the students, some were in between. And also when dividing students who were creative and those who were less creative, actually the creative students answered closer to the Nobel laureates. So really, we had the Nobel laureates who are assumed to be very creative at one end and the patients at the other end. So in a sense, opposing the idea of, of Carlson. But following Rothenberg, there were a set of studies who came, the first by Anderson in 1989, looking at 30 writers at the Iowa Writers Workshop, which is a prestigious workshop in the States. And she could show that approximately 43% of them had bipolar illness, compared to only 10% in the controls. And similar results were found in relatives to patients. Jameson followed up. 47 um, live British authors, 38% reported having been treated for affective illness, basically bipolar disorder or unipolar depression. Ludwig made a bigger study, 1,005 individuals uh, who had their biographies published in the New Times Book Review from 1960 to 1990. And using this uh, inclusion criteria, he was able to estimate that approximately 3% of them had had a manic episode. Which is quite a lot, because it's assumed that approximately 1% of the general population have a manic episode. But then he just decreased the, the, and only looked on those with classical creative occupations. And he could then see that the number of those suffering manic episodes, historically, rose to 10%. So pointing at the fact that there probably is an increase of manic episodes as a part of bipolar disorder in this group. Now I mention these three studies um, partly because they are, are good, but also because they have been seriously criticized. And more lately by Schlesinger uh, in her book The Insanity Hoax, uh, I think published in 2012. And Schlesinger argues still today much on the findings by Rothenberg that there is no hard proof that highly creative people are more susceptible to mental disorder than anybody else. It's just a hoax, basically. And her criticism is that the authors of these three studies both selected study subjects and in general themselves made a diagnosis without support in recognized diagnostical manuals. Now this would open up for bias and also for difficulties in um, sort of generalizing these results to a larger sample. And I have to say, I think it's uh, good to have uh, sound skepticism, but the main problem with Schlesinger's criticism is that she is solely focused on these three studies. And the field has evolved tremendously since these three studies were published. This is by a Dutch colleague um, who uh, have reviewed recently the number of scientific studies in this area. And as you can see, the number of studies following these three studies are quite many. And what you can't see here is actually that the number of good studies have also increased a lot. Now, some of these more newer studies use what is called neuroimaging methodology to look into the brain, what really happens in the brain 
when one is creative. So in 2001, Professor Seki, in an essay published in Science, coined the research field of neuroesthetics. And I will present one study, um, which was done by colleagues of ours at uh, Karolinska. But also in 2009, there was a study of 200 individuals, healthy individuals, which were estimated for creativity using an inventory. And those with the highest scores on creativity, they were found more often to have a certain type of a gene. And this gene has previously been associated with a risk for psychosis. So now we have a gene that is associated with increased creativity and also with increased risk for psychosis. So there has been a progression of the field, but still some weaknesses are present within many of the studies. And basically it is the use of retrospective um, biographies for information, but also to some sense using uh, small uh, cohorts. But still I would say that most of authors today argue that there probably is an association between creativity and mental disorder, and that it somehow is reflected in the brain. Now, how many of you have heard about these uh, studies before? Just raise your hand. Okay, so not so many of you. <laughs> and how many of you have heard about the idea of a connection between genius and madness? Some more. So it's not really these studies that has sort of put the stronghold on our society for this idea. It is more the case of popular culture like uh, literature and movies. And since we have Professor Hanisch here, I made a small clip of such a movie <laughs> that I think many of you have also seen, actually. obvious case of the mad scientist. Which movie? <laughs> so most of you have probably seen it, yes, of course. Now on this background of this uh, sort of long-standing myth uh, since classical antiquity, the comparably weak empirical support and actually Sweden's unique position with national health registries, we wanted to address this question. And our question was, do persons with mental disorder more often have a creative occupation than people without a mental disorder? So we started to think on how to do this. And the first question was, of course, which diagnosis should we use? We started off with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, and also by a reviewer requested to add unipolar depression as a sort of comparison. And in our registries, we could identify 54,000 patients with schizophrenia, uh, almost 30,000 with bipolar disorder, and roughly 200,000 with unipolar depression. So as you can see, this is a lot more than previous studies. But in fact, we could also identify all first, second, and third degree relatives to these patients, and then compare to controls, 10 times more controls actually, in general population. So in a sense, most of Sweden is actually in this study. <laughs> Well, the question was, of course, how do we define creative occupations? And I will tell you that we worked with different definitions through the studies, actually four different definitions, but we ended up with a rather narrow and conservative definition, basically scientists and artists, which is the most common definition. But I can tell you that the results that I will present are basically the same regardless of the definition. So we also used broader definitions. And what we see here, if we focus on the red line here, can you all see it? 
So it's this line up here. This denotes an odds ratio of 1. Basically, that uh, chance of having a creative occupation defined as artistic or scientific occupation is the same as in the general population. And at the top, A, we have schizophrenia, in the, B, uh, in the middle, B, bipolar disorder, and at the end, unipolar depression. And what we can see directly is that in A and B, schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, there is a significant increase. And I'll see if I can... Yes. And, but if you look on the patient, the schizophrenic patient actually has no increase, also not the unipolar patient, but in fact the bipolar patient has an increase. But you can see here that relatives of patients with schizophrenia, they have an increase of creative occupation, as well as do bipolar patients, but you see no similar pattern for patient or relatives with unipolar depression, that is, depressive episodes without uh, manic episodes. And you can also see actually that there seems to be a sort of a, uh, with decreasing familial distance, there is a decrease in the likelihood of having a creative occupation also. So what we argue is that we did find an increase of creativity in these two groups, that is patients with bipolar disorder, as well as relatives of patients with schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, and that this finding is specific because it is not present to the same extent in unipolar depression. Now the question is, of course, why should we bother to investigate relatives of patients? And one of the reasons is that psychiatric disorders increasingly are not viewed upon as black or white, but more as a continuum of symptoms. So when we talk, for instance, about psychosis or the aberrant perception of reality, we might argue that some of us are open to experiences in general, some are maybe even more curious than the than, than the mean, and some are maybe even interested in bizarre things, and eventually it might actually end up in being psychosis. So when we talk about the patient with psychosis, we talk about the extreme cases. And what we know from previous studies is that relatives of patients, even though they might not have uh, sort of the extreme features of the patients, they still have more in general than do the mean population. So the idea, idea would then be that there might be sort of small increases in psychotic features, might be beneficial, but when it starts to be too much, then actually it is detrimental for creativity, as could be seen in patients with schizophrenia. The relatives had increases, but the patients not themselves. Now related to this question is, of course, what is creativity? So does anyone have a, an answer to that question? What is creativity? Good. I hear some suggestions. I think they are good, uh, new, and uh, sort of not belonging to the sort of the context or making something new. And these are good uh, uh, um, examples of definitions. Actually, there is no really good definition. Uh, so creativity research has struggled for like 50 years trying to define uh, creativity. Uh, but one easy way or more sort of clear way to approach the question is to look on how we investigate creativity. And in that sense, we usually talk about uh, three Ps. We're actually oh, five, four or five Ps, but I will only talk about three Ps. <laughs> and the first P is uh, creative personality. So we might ask... What is it in personality that makes certain people creative? For instance, Einstein. What is his personality traits? And what we see consistently is that creative people in general are more open to experiences. They tend to be more tolerant and also to some extent uh, be more opposing to authorities. Now the second P is the creative process. So we might investigate what really happens in the brain, for instance, when we have an insight or when we are creative. But you do not need to use the sort of modern methods. So for instance, Wallace from 1926, uh, six, he used the, the stage theory uh, with preparation. And of course, then you need to, to go back for a while. And then you have this illumination. I think most of you know about this idea. 
And the third P is the product. So we might ask, what is it that makes uh, creative products come? So this is a sort of a perspective that has often been more used within economics, while the first and second uh, more in psychology. But these are the three different P's. And just to give you a hint of the difficulties that uh, are present in creativity research, we made a, uh, what is called a meta-analysis. Meta -analysis. We put together the studies uh, using neuroimaging and creativity. And these were approximately 11 articles. And we then divided the different paradigms into visual, auditive, and verbal. And that's why there are red, blue, and green dots. But basically what we see is that different parts of the brain are activated. And actually, throughout all the studies, there is no single part that is consistently being activated. So we cannot really say that creativity is in that spot of the brain. And the problem is, of course, that all the studies use different paradigms to define creativity. But there is one way that we often try to investigate a central aspect of the creative process. And this is tested with this classic nine-dot test. Now, for those of you who have not seen this test before, the mission here is to use four straight lines that are connected, striking or crossing over all the nine dots. Four connected straight lines crossing over all nine dots. And I'll give you a minute if you haven't seen this one before. Please, go ahead. So actually, this is quite difficult for many of us, but uh, the answer is, of course, simple once we know it. It is not to be restrained within the figure. So this kind of thinking, sort of not being restrained within the figure, is what is daily called divergent thinking. And what is interesting with divergent thinking, or actually thinking outside of the box, if you will, is that colleagues of ours at Karolinska have looked what happens in the brain, or actually in relation to uh, uh, receptors in the brain, and this is a busy slide, but if you look on uh, this figure here, you can see what is called the B-score, that is a measurement of divergent thinking, and on this axis you have what is called dopamine binding potential, and basically what you see is that if the dopamine binding potential goes down, you will see an increase in divergent thinking. Okay. So what is dopamine binding potential? Well, for those of you who do not know how the brain works, the brain consists of a number of nerve cells that are all sort of interconnected uh, like this, where the communication is uh, passed through electrical currents. But at the end of one nerve cell, um, you have what is called the synapse. So here and it looks like this. And the information from each nerve cell to the, to the other is passed through small molecules called neurotransmitters. So they go out here and they uh, go to the receptor on the other side. Now dopamine is one of these uh, neurotransmitters that are very important in the brain. So going back to this uh, study, decreased dopamine poten binding potential could, could mean an increase in dopamine. So basically, more dopamine in this area of the brain called the thalamus results in 
better capability to think outside of the box. Okay, so what does the thalamus do? Well, of course, it's also a complicated structure, but one might see the thalamus as a sort of a filter, filtering out things that we deem unnecessary or irrelevant to even consider. And then, of course, we realize that if this filter would let more things through, we would have the possibility to make more sort of unexpected associations and get more ideas. Okay, but at the same time, it would be difficult to handle reality, of course, as in psychosis. And the interesting thing is that actually similar findings have been done in patients with schizophrenia. And a beautiful study by Owen and colleagues actually investigate if it might be so that patients with schizophrenia actually have more access to more ideas that we deem irrelevant. And what they did was that they put two types of logical conclusions. The first one called common sense invalid. If the sun rises, then the sun is in the east. The sun is in the east, therefore the sun rises. Okay? So we know that the sun rises, but it's actually invalid because, according to this one, the sun could do something else. The second one is non-common sense valid. All buildings speak loudly. A hospital does not speak loudly. Therefore, a hospital is not a building. Now, we know that buildings do not speak in general, and it's actually a valid conclusion. Now, the fascinating part is, if you take, as they did, uh, some 20 patients with schizophrenia and compare them to approximately 20 healthy controls, in fact, patients with schizophrenia are superior. They are superior to you know, making logical conclusions. And I find this fascinating because we consider schizophrenia as a cognitive disorder. <clears throat> and actually, if you look on the two types of logical conclusions, to a larger extent, the effect is driven by this uh, uh, logical conclusion that goes against common sense, that the sun rises. So you might see it, if you will, that the patients are less restrained by things that we take for granted. And the sort of neurophysiological foundation might be the findings that our colleagues made on the previous slide. And in that uh, sense, I always uh, reference Shaw. The reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable <laughs> man. Well... Okay, so we have uh, expanded on our previous uh, results, uh, looking on many different psychiatric disorders in a cohort of more than one million patients and all of their relatives. But what we see is basically that the increase of creative profession is present in schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, and maybe to some extent in relatives of patients with autism and anorexia nervosa. So in order to understand these findings, we need to know that there is a big discussion, or at least used to be a big discussion in creativity research about domain generality or domain specificity. So is creativity something that is present regardless of the creative expression, or is it specific for every type of expression? So this is from a study using a standard inventory, the Creative Achievement Questionnaire, and what we see are different ways of being creative, so drama, writing, humor, music, and so on. But it actually boils down to two specific factors, the artistic and the scientific, and that is one of the reasons that we use this definition of creative profi professions. So going back to our results, what we see is, in relatives of patients, that actually in schizophrenia, although in all three types of disorders, the relatives have an increase of overall creative professions in relation to the population, but in schizophrenia, it seems to be somewhat more in the artistic uh, occupations, whereas in autism, it is much more the scientific occupations, and bipolar disorder being placed somewhere in between. And these findings are actually also, in a sense, validated by a more previous study uh, by Campbell, investigating 900 students at Princeton University, and what they found was that simply asking the student if they have a relative with a psychiatric disorder, and only here focusing on bipolar and autism, that if you have a relative with a bipolar disorder, 
you are much more likely to choose a humanistic major. And if you have a relative with autism, then you're much more likely, or at least more likely, to choose a technological or scientific major. So indeed, it seems that something here is actually, in a sense, um, choosing our intellectual interests. Now, to uh, conclude this lecture, I just want to talk about uh, something that we are looking into uh, presently. So these are unpublished uh, results. Um, but it's related, in fact, uh, to the quote by Aristotle that we heard from the beginning. And that is that especially bipolar disorder might be associated with superior leadership skills. Now, this is a question that has also been abundant and probably just as long as the Association for Creativity. And it was recently uh, also written about in a book by Nasser Gaimi, who is a professor at Tuft, where he argued that almost all the uh, sort of historical major leaders of our time suffered from bipolar disorder or to some extent uh, uh, temperament related to bipolar disorder. So, for instance, he says that Napoleon and Lincoln and, of course, Churchill and I mean, most had bipolar disorder or these tendencies. Now, of course, this is a very nice book, but as always, it's difficult to say what the empirical support for this uh, um, idea is. There is actually one study from 1963 looking at 30 patients with bipolar disorder and 30 controls asking a lot of questions, and one was, I nearly always strive hard for personal achievement. 93.3% of the patients said yes, only 60% of the controls. So this would imply that maybe bipolar patients put more effort in personal achievement, and this has been linked to uh, leadership skills in other studies. But this is weak, I have to say. So we wanted to use our registries uh, trying to investigate this question, and in Sweden, it used to be that males had to be conscripted. And all of these uh, who were conscripted made an intellectual test. And those who made the intellectual test at norm or above were subjected to a leadership uh, sort of interview, a semi-structured interview about 30 minutes, assessing their leadership potential. And the results were presented from one to nine, where one is very low leadership potential, and nine is very high leadership potential. So we looked on bipolar disorder, patients with bipolar disorder, or those uh, afterwards getting bipolar disorder, and then compared controls. And what we see is that in this group with very low leadership potential, there is a, three, a threefold increase uh, when it comes to bipolar patients. So bipolar patients are much more likely to have low leadership potential. But then if you go down to level 9, that is where they have very high leadership potential, in fact, it is no difference uh, to the general population. Okay? So Aristotle was probably right to some sense, but it seems uh, only half right. We can see no relationship here to, to leadership potential. And I have to say, I like this with research because it's really proving that something are right and something are wrong. But I have to also say that it feels a bit boring, actually. So we did look a bit more to see if there might be something else sort of hiding here in the data. And then you need to know that bipolar disorder is a very broad disorder. And presently we talk about at least two types. One is uh, sort of uh, with the presence of euphoric mania, and the other with more dysphoric mania. And it seems to be that those with dysphoric mania, to a larger degree, have other psychiatric disorders present, uh, and not only bipolar disorder. So we investigated those patients only with bipolar disorder without psychiatric, other psychiatric disorders. And what we see then is that there is still this increase at lower levels of uh, assessment of leadership potential. But actually now, there's also an increase here at the higher levels. And actually, on the highest level of leadership potential, there is a significant increase. So in the group with bipolar disorder, but only those without 
psychiatric comorbidity. And to finish off, I'd just like to uh, refer to Sher Johnson from Berkeley, who is a professor who has uh, done uh, a psychotherapeutic model, a CBT model, for the idea that patients with bipolar disorder are sort of sensitive to, uh, to rewards and, and are very goal-oriented. And she has actually made a CBT model in a clinical setting where she has treated bipolar patients on this very idea that patients of this kind are more motivated and reward sensitive and have, as I understand it, good results. And I have to say, I think this is really some of the sort of nicer studies and maybe more rewarding studies that really come out of, of this field of creativity and mental illness. Because in the end, they really stress sort of, um, you know, the, the, uh, the potential that uh, patients with severe psychiatric disorders harbor. That it's really useful to put an effort into helping patients with severe psychiatric disorders. Thank you. I'm too slow. <clears throat> yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Simon Kiaga. I guess that among the roughly 300 people, there will be a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. My colleague Kirsten Kranz will walk around with the microphone. So please wait for her so that everyone can understand your question. Please. There's someone. I was wondering, is there also um, some research of uh, artistic people, um, if there is there a difference between the right side of the brain and the left side of the brain, like, um, well, <laughs> the functioning of of the brain, if there, if you can also see a, a difference, uh, well, I say, I, I I know a little about it that. For instance, I don't know really, but one side of the brain is more rational and the other one is more emotional. And uh, one side of the brain is more linguistic and the other side is more... And I thought maybe there's also uh, maybe some um, relation to artistic people and madness maybe, but. I don't know. Is there? So it's a good question. If the uh, sort of findings in, uh, if you say, in neuroimaging studies in autism could be related to uh, a possible association with creativity. Yeah. And uh, first, you have to say that I'm no expert in autism. There is a large field of studies in autism, but there is an interesting uh, hypothesis that is really a hypothesis. It is not really based in, in empirical support. But that is one of the reasons that I put up this slide with schizophrenia at one end and autism at the other end. Because it's been, in, it's been argumented by, for instance, uh, Simon Baron Cohen, that in fact schizophrenia and autism could be placed on two poles. With, uh, uh, if you will, schizophrenia at a more mentalistic extreme and autism at a more mechanistic extreme. And the underlying uh, sort of neurophysiological aspect of that would be in a sense that in autism you would see a larger uh, lateralization, which means that there is a difference in size between our brains with the, with the left being dominant and, and so on. So it would be a, a larger lateralization in autism which would underlie this tendency towards a mechanistic reasoning. Okay. But I have to say that that is a, a hypothesis that has also raised a lot of criticism. Mm. Yeah. But it is interesting. And you can actually, I mean, it, you can actually also consider that uh, on epigenetic uh, foundation uh, because it should be uh, 
you know, there, there could be epigenetic mechanism underlying these uh, sort of differences in lateralization. Okay. Yeah, thank you. I also was wondering, all the results are from uh, European studies. How is it like for Asian studies or something? Because I, I, can, uh, I can imagine that it would be totally different. I mean, also the, um, uh, the explanation of what is an artistic person and what is a mad, mad person would be a totally different definition in another culture. Like, oh, That's also a very good question, if there are cultural differences. And uh, again, I'm no expert in that either, actually. But, um, well, I mean, it depends a lot about how you look on different psychiatric disorders. I think uh, some would argue that there is actually, uh, for instance, uh, more severe schizophrenia is a global phenomenon that, that is actually present to the approximately same prevalence or, or incidence in, in, around the globe. For instance, Crow would argue that. But other studies show that there is a difference around the world, which probably would be based on that we interpret uh, sort of uh, psychiatric disorders uh, differently. Now, I looked on, on uh, studies on psychiatric disorder and creativity, and as you point out, most of them are from the Western world. So there's a, a heavy uh, dominance there. I can only relate to your question by saying that, you know, I'm half Tibetan. And uh, my uncle is actually an uh, oracle. Uh, so I think in many places in Sweden, he would be viewed upon as uh, being somewhat, um, well, not ordinary. But in his place, he is considered as a very esteemed person. So, I mean, you're right in a sense. Mm. Uh, when a person with a certain mental condition uh, uses medication for that, does it affect the creativity as well then? Uh, so your question was if you could use, if you have a psychiatric disorder, if you can use meditation and how that would affect creativity. Mm -hmm. Yes. Medication. Aha, uh -huh, medica uh -huh, if you use medication, yes. <laughs> well. <laughs> Actually, um, I'm interested in meditation. So. <laughs> uh, well, so it's not a very uncommon question. And, uh, yes. So, uh, I mean, I can talk from a clinical sense, and I can tell you, uh, I think that uh, psychiatric disorders should be treated, uh, when it's necessary with pharmacological compounds, when it's necessary with uh, psychotherapeutic uh, interventions, and now more recently with physical activity and so on. So these are disorders that should be treated. I mean, but um, the literature on the effect of, of uh, medications on creativity is very small. Actually, it boils down to two studies. Uh, and one is this one by Shaw, where they investigated lithium treatment in bipolar disorder. And um, so everybody had lithium at a level that was at the standard level for lithium treatment. And then they assessed basically a measurement of divergent thinking, like a baseline. Uh, well, I'll do it like this instead. And then after one week, some were put on placebo, so they did not uh, receive lithium. And as you can see here, the, the mean level of lithium went down, and the number of associations, a sort of a measurement of fluency or divided thinking, actually significantly went up. And then these patients were put back on lithium, week four and five, and uh, the lithium level in the blood was raised again, and then you could see actually that the number of associations went down. So a clear evidence that lithium actually affects the ability to make uh, associations or divergent thinking, which is often reported by patients that they feel, uh, you know, uh, a bit slower on, on treatment uh, in lithium. So if this would be the only, you know, research supporting treatment or not, it would be a pretty clear case. But the fact is also, if you look on, on this is a pretty new study 
on the effect of lithium on bipolar disorder. And I will not uh, tell you uh, all the results of this study, but basically what we see is that if we uh, reduce uh, lithium, not only uh, take it away, but reduce it to a level lower than 0 0.6, there is a double increase in the risk of getting uh, a new episode of, of uh, depression or mania. And in fact, the second study looking on creativity and, and lithium also touches upon this. It is an investigation on 24 manic depressive artists in whom uh, uh, lithium treatment was received. And they answered uh, retrospectively how they felt that their artistic creativity uh, was uh, sort of influenced by lithium treatment. And of these 24 pay, uh, artists, 12 said that it was a positive effect because the sort of the, the risk of, of having a manic episode of depression was so severe, so that actually reduced their creativity long term. On the other hand, six uh, artists said it had actually affected negatively, and six said that it didn't really matter for artistic. So, but still results are that the double effect, the double uh, art artists still said that the effect of lithium was beneficial in the long run. But the acute effect is clearly that the divergent thinking is affected. Thank you. So uh, this is lithium and, and for other uh, drugs there are no studies as far as I know, but of course you could argue similarly. Has creativity anything to do with uh, psychosis or bipolar disorder or autistic, uh, autistic disorder? For instance, is Da Vinci crazy? Um, so I think the question was if uh, you, like disorder itself has anything to do. Yes, I mean it. Yeah. Well, I I think our findings uh, point at least to that on a on a general level, um, there is an increase in patients with bipolar disorder, which would suggest that actually bipolar disorder might be associated with increased creativity. As I presented, uh, but, but also if you the... consider normal people, pardon? If you consider creativity of normal people, if uh, pardon, if I consider yes, if you consider that with a creativity on uh, based on normal people with no disease. Um, you know, I mean control groups. Yeah. Is so there, is there uh, is there a direct link between creativity and madness? Well, well, if you want a simple answer, yes. Thank you. I'm crazy. <laughs> but I think it's very important to stress also that, you know, I do not think that you need to be, uh, have a psychiatric disorder in order to be creative. If anything, our results show that most artists and scientists do not have a psychiatric disorder. But was the question maybe... Uh, also related to that your uh, studies show a correlation mm -hmm. but you don't show a causal link I think was that maybe your question because that would have been uh, interesting I mean would you speculate on what are the causes hmm. so you're very right of course these are associations yeah. and uh, it's uh, um, family studies so we can only say that we have familial associations. Mm -hmm. But I, th I think that um, it's reasonable to suspect that there are some heritable personality traits mm -hmm. that are associated with creativity and also the risk of attracting psychiatric disorder. Just quickly following up, because in the beginning you mentioned the research that related to traumatic events, mm -hmm. the closeness to death events mm -hmm. uh, that sparked um, creativity. Mm -hmm. You didn't follow that line of research, did you? No. But is there something going on in that respect? Because that would be, I mean, might give us a hint to some other kind of causal um, connections. Well, you know, that's not really the field that I'm in, so the research that we do is from a completely different aspect. But I, I, I put that in the, in the presentation to really show that 
This is not a, a static association. Things happen in our lives that affect us clearly, and that goes for creativity as well as for many other things in life. So we are affected. But still, I think it's interesting why... Because this is clear, I mean, why doesn't everybody respond in the same way? There has to be some difference um, for this. And I would argue that there uh, probably is some kind of more stable trait that could be linked to the vulnerability of psychiatric disorder, but also the likelihood of actually expressing creativity. I mean, it's, uh, it's really off topic today, but, but it might... Most of us think that creativity is attractive, and that's a good question. Why do we want to be creative? Most of us want to be creative. Most of us think that is creative is attractive and so on, and that's a good question. Why? Because usually creativity is, uh, you know, includes effort and a lot of work and, and so on, and maybe even the risk of getting a psychiatric disorder. So, <laughs> And I have no answer, actually. But, uh, I mean, these are the, actually the questions that we are trying to address with our um, coming research, actually. Hmm. Okay, there was a gentleman in the back and... Uh, well, one, actually, uh, um, I, I, would, I would think that the particular disorder that could be related to creativity uh, should be obsessive-compulsive disorder because those people are supposed to be passionate about finding new things. But uh, I was wondering if you left, if you um, leave out that case um, on purpose, because I could only see like schizophrenia and um, autism and. Um, well, yeah, you know, it's a good question, and I think it's a good idea actually. Um, actually, I think that kind of reasoning has some bearing on the findings of Anorexia Generosa. Um, um, but that's another topic. Um, we did look on obsessive compulsive disorder, but it's aggregated in a group of anxiety disorders, and we did not find uh, any increase in that group. And I, I don't think that it has been described in, in previous literature, at least not consistently, that there should be an increase. I would... I mean, do you really think that that artists would, don't you think that sort of scientists would display that more? Well, maybe, I don't know. I, I, would, I would expect art, also artists to get uh, obsessive with what they're doing, to do it better. Yeah. At least, yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's a good point that probably, you know, having this tendency to be, you know, obsessive in a sort of, a psychological sense probably has benefits in many different situations, but having an obsessive compulsive disorder, that's, I mean, a really severe state that causes uh, this dysfunction. So I wonder if it's really uh, useful. But, I mean, it's, it's difficult to say. I can say that most of our patients that we uh, got, at least in the first study, were based on inpatient treatment. Uh, so, for instance, we looked on ADHD, but it's not really a good sample for investigating ADHD because it's mainly inpatient-treated ADHD patients. So we need to look on these questions with different paradigms, but I would argue that that has actually been done to a large extent, but maybe not for obsessive-compulsive disorder then. Thank you. We already have a kind of list. There was a gentleman in the back and then someone here in the third row. Yeah. Um, I wonder if, if there is a paradox between people that are artistic and schizophrenic because there are people that are both. What's your view on the people that are both artistic and schizophrenic? <laughs> you mean in terms of creativity or...? <laughs> oh, that's a tough one. <laughs> no, I... I don't know, actually. <laughs> no. <laughs> but it's a good question. Well, yeah, the question why creativity is such attractiveness to people. Well, 
I might have a suggestion for you because I think if you look back on people surviving, then the creative person uh, in an endangered situation would have the best options probably. So if you pick the creative one or the non-creative one, in a really bad situation, you would have more options with the creative person. So that could be a reason. I don't know. It's just my head. Yeah. So. But it's, it's a, I mean, obviously, uh, it's a very good thing to be uh, creative in a stressful situation. And we are addressing these questions, actually, in studies uh, with a more evolutionary perspective. But I wonder, actually, if that explains the propensity for people to write poems when they are in love. <laughs> so why do we do that? Well, probably to show effectiveness weakness as well and love right. and maybe to show the person hey I'm creative <laughs> but that's also just a suggestion just showing up then <laughs> my, my, tr my true question was about the lithium thing uh, you showed that uh, the first weeks they had the lithium and then they were off and then they had it again mm -hmm. and I'm uh, expecting that they didn't know it and the person it was double blind tested but I'm wondering, did you have a control group that was on lithium the whole time period? That's Does a very good exist? question. I, I don't think so, but I'm not sure. Because but I can look it up. Yeah, because then I'm already doubting of the uh, liability of the thing, because it could also be an effect of the long period that if you're on lithium uh, uh, for a long period, then it it, it drops down or it raises and then uh, it drops down again or whatever, so it fluctuates. I think in general you have a good point. Actually, I spoke to AstraZeneca in Sweden trying to make these kind of studies because it's an uh, often encountered problem uh, in patients um, that uh, it's difficult to, to, to stay on treatment. Um, and it's not very unusual, of course, that you have to find sort of a middle ground um, that works. And I think it would be very helpful to have longer studies investigating this association. And I, I mean, these are two small studies, but they are still sort of um, important, I think, because they point to the fact that the patients are right when they claim uh, that there might be a decrease in divergent thinking, but still in the long run it might still be beneficial. And I think this is a good discussion to have with a patient. Have you considered um, uh, creativity and artistic uh, capabilities that lead to mental disorders? So, for example, in the populations for all of these studies, uh, was it always um, the mental disorder that preceded the, creative, the creativity or, or since sometimes it was the other way around? Well, I mean, this is a good question and, and sort of in a sense points to your previous question. But I think one answer is, is simply to say that, maybe I wasn't clear on that, but the relatives of patients, they were healthy. They did not have a psychiatric disorder. So in that sense, you could say that it's probably not the psychiatric disorder in itself that affects the increased creativity, rather some traits underlying. I mean, you could argue that. But of course, you could still argue that they might get the psychiatric disorder if they live long enough or, uh, or so. But we did actually look on, uh, specifically investigate, that because uh, on the last uh, slides uh, for leadership, and that is a very interesting question because uh, you make this conscript interview when you're around 18, so most of them had <laughs> not uh, uh, gotten bipolar disorder at the moment that they were actually investigated with this uh, interview. Uh, so we did a separate uh, analysis just comparing those who actually had bipolar disorder before the interview with those who got bipolar disorder afterwards, but there was no difference between these two groups. Okay, now Kirsten, you have a long way to go. There's a finger very much in the back, and then I have, yeah, someone over there. Well, but she was first. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I was also wondering, is there a link between uh, creativity and the abuse of drugs? Because uh, if I look uh, around with a lot of artists these days, they also like to use a lot of drugs. So. 
Right. Uh, yes, we did, uh, of course, investigate a question because it's uh, also very often claimed that there is an association between substance abuse and creativity. And, uh, you know, we had this table that were like three pages long where we looked on every uh, artistic occupation and every psychiatric disorder. So I won't bring that slide up here. But um, uh, what one can say from previous studies is pretty much, uh, as I mentioned, uh, when it comes to lithium, but the other way around, that there are a number of studies showing that there is an increase in divergent thinking when you drink alcohol. And you need to drink, if I don't remember wrongly, <laughs> over 0.8 or 0.6. Uh, but what our study did find, I think it's fair to say, that there was a clear decrease of, uh, of uh, severe alcohol and drug abuse in overall creative professions, um, because it is a destructive disorder. But then again, if you looked on specific artistic occupations within the group, we had eight different occupations, so for instance, musicians and authors and uh, stage artists and so on. And I think it was pretty clear that in those uh, artistic occupations where it was more of a, like uh, performing on a scene, there, there seemed to be a somewhat increase in the use of, of, of substances. And also, in general, we actually specifically investigated authors because uh, previous literature has always sort of pointed at, specifically at, at writers as being afflicted with mental disorders. And uh, that was actually interesting that I mentioned that we saw this specific increase in schizophrenia and bipolar disorder for the overall creative professions, but in authors or writers, we found an increase of almost all psychiatric disorders and actually a significant 50% increase in committed suicide. Uh, so uh, I do not think that, uh, that that is due to genetical factors, uh, although Crow would probably argue that there might be. <laughs> I think that is probably more reflecting sort of the situation for, for being an author, since there was an overall increase of psychiatric disorders in that group, including substance abuse. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks. It's nice that she asked the question about drugs because my question is very unscientific as well. Um, well, I always link creativity to passion. And uh, you mentioned the word meditation. And I remember a meditation teacher who told me that uh, passion is like a tiger. Either you learn how to ride the tiger or the tiger will eat you alive. And this process, I call, you can also call it madness, right? And uh, my question is, if you think um, if meditation is good for people who call themselves, who call themselves creative, in order not to become mad or, yeah, I don't know. Well, so it's a very good question. I don't have very much uh, support for that, I think, but I think meditation is probably good for most of us. Um, but I just want to, we didn't touch upon that actually. Um, so when we talk about psychiatric disorders, uh, we did not touch upon that, but I think it's fair to say that there is a big difference between different psychiatric disorders, which also comes back to a previous uh, comment of, on the evolution perspective. So we investigated just fertility uh, in different psychiatric disorders, and what you can see is there's a big difference depending on what psychiatric disorder you have. Um, and this also relates to the how common a psychiatric disorder is. So what you can see here is basically that in the most severe psychiatric disorder, there is a large uh, decrease in fertility, and the same disorders in general also are very uncommon, at least compared to many of the other psychiatric disorders. So I don't think it's fair to say that, you know, all psychiatric disorders are, are the same. I think there is a real difference between, for instance, schizophrenia that is around 
1% in the population, compared to anxiety disorders, which are maybe present in 25% of, of the population. So you can't just say that, you know, they're all the same. But relating to your question on meditation, uh, I, uh, I think clinically at least it would be beneficial uh, with meditation for these disorders that are more common. But I do not think that you can meditate away schizophrenia, for instance. But it is a good point, you know. Thanks. We had a gentleman here in the fifth row who was raising his arm for quite some time. I think we have time for three more questions. Let's take this one, and then this one, and I think in the very back, I saw your hand also. Um. All right, how important in your personal opinion, uh, here, sorry. <laughs> How important, in your personal opinion, would you say uh, that uh, mental illness uh, is involved in creativity? Uh, do you mean actually having the psychiatric disorder, or do you mean, you know, in general? Having the psychiatric disorder, uh, does that help creativity a lot? No, I would say, you know, the basic message would be that those creators that are creative uh, having a psychiatric disorder or being creative in spite of creative of having a, a psychiatric disorder. All right. So it is not helpful to have a psychiatric disorder in I general. <laughs> yeah. But uh, that's but, a good point. But relating to that, I think that there may be features present in the population at around 20, 25 percent that are related to the risk of attracting a psychiatric disorder that might be beneficial for uh, creativity. And we have actually investigated that in 11,000 uh, people. And the numbers are around 22%. All right, thank you. Sure. Can you raise your arm again? Yeah. She's left. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> um, well, I have a question that follows pretty closely after the, the last one. Um, be, I, I, you're probably more than just a casual observer of popular culture and the, this idea, the glorification of mental illness and its link to creativity. Now, you mentioned the Romantic period and that that was a big thing in the Romantic period. The Romantics made a big deal out of a mental illness and creativity. But in your observation, is that something which is still in, in popular culture today, a glorified idea? Uh, having a psychiatric disorder or the association? Well, well, they, 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 that, that creative people are mad and that it's, that it's actually good for your creativity to be mad. Yes, I think it's in a sense it is and it's an unfortunate uh, idea actually if it glorifies, uh, especially if it prevents people from seeking treatment that is necessary. I mean, there are a number of Hollywood movies that have been presented the last years on this topic. I can think of quite a few rock uh, musicians, singers, and so on, who also, you know, this, this idea of uh, drug abuse, madness, and, and creativity, that they go hand in hand and are actually inseparable. You know? Right, right. So it is interesting that if you read, for instance, uh, Becker, who has investigated the history, uh, more specifically, on the association between creativity and mental disorder, you can clearly see that, uh, you know, in periods of time, creators have been associated with, you know, pure, pure madness to, you know, rational thought. So it's really changing according to culture. Okay. Thank you. Okay, now in the very back on the right-hand side. Um, I wondered, since this um, creativity and many of the psychiatric disorders, they are multifactorial disorders, they are influenced by environment and many other factors, uh, plus genetic factors. If you ever done, or if there's any study done on children that are relatives of these uh, patients with psychiatric disorders, because creativity can be influenced by many things like education or background, like social status, but maybe with children it would be more... Um, I don't know, maybe a genetic basis would be more 
um, dominant factor that influenced their creativity. Uh, do you mean if we have investigated uh, the offspring in general, or do you mean children specifically, young people? Um, children, which are relatives or like control, not, not relatives of people with any psychiatric disorder? Well, there are some studies in young people investigating especially intellectual disability. And I think in general, they show that um, yeah, it is not associated with creativity. Um, but I think related to your question is that, I mean, we investigated offspring of patients in relation to creativity. And uh, um, I don't know if I should show this slide, but I think it's one thing is really obvious, and that is that I have to go all the way back. <laughs> um, that so here you have uh, first three relatives. So that is the parent, that is the sibling, and that is the offspring. So genetically, they have basically the same amount of uh, they share the same amount of of genes um, with the uh, with the patient. But it's clearly that it is a difference in the expression of creative professions, uh, that the offspring has less than do siblings and parents. And I, I actually it could also imply a genetical background, but I think this implies uh, the social factors relating to the possibility to express creativity. Well, the fact that you have shown clearly that their relatives to patients with mental disorders are more often creative makes me think that if I have a sister who's an actress and a brother who is an artist, what kind of diagnosis does that make? <laughs> well, thanks a lot for your, uh, for your coming and let's uh, thank Simon Kiaga for this lively talk and his Q&A and we have a small present. Great. Which is here. It is a great Dutch novel, The Discovery of Heaven. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and, uh, well, thank, you. thank you very much.